Catherine. Hello. Hi, thank you for being here. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, I need to do the sharing of my slides. So Okay. <laughs> it should work. It's worked so far, but I have them just in case, so not to worry. Okay, so um, do I need to have control or anything like I, that? I don't think so, but I'll give it to you if you need it. <laughs> yeah, because I have my slides here, but I can't see how to... Oh, here it is. That's all right. I need to just be full screen. Share screen. Let me do that. Okay. There you go. There. You can see them okay, can you? We can. Oh, do it. <laughs> I'll be big. All right, this is the bit where I normally know how to do it. And of course, I've forgotten. There we go. So I'm current slide. So hi, I believe I have 10 minutes. I'm going to do my best to stick to that. Is that still 10 minutes okay? That That's fantastic. Okay, I'm going to be well behaved. So thank you <laughs> so much to everyone who's already contributed. It's just so lovely to hear from people. And a lot of what people are sharing, I also find really helpful for my own self-care at this time. Um, so I, we were having a chat, myself and Karen, and I was saying some of the things that I'm involved in, and it was thought that perhaps it might um, be interesting for people to hear. I don't feel an expert in the violent Oaklander model, but I'm a pretty long-standing social worker working with diversity issues and oppression in an urban environment in South London. And um, perhaps I might have some thoughts that might be useful to you. So I have peppered it with images and uh, quotes from diverse traditions, just ones that I had handy. <laughs> this beautiful quote from Langston Hughes there. So the focus of my sharing is my, my anti-racist musings <laughs> at a time of change. And why me? Why now? What's this white woman doing here, rabbiting on about this? I am speaking as an ally, which is a, a term that is used in England. I don't know if that travels for people, but like a friend of people suffering oppression. So all of our groups at work, whether it's um, for gay rights, for women's rights, for black rights, we can be a member of those also as an ally. And sometimes they'll have closed conversations and sometimes they'll have open involving allies as well because oppression is not just a problem of the oppressed person that's the idea behind it so i'm believe it or not weirdly i am the chair of a black-led charity it was because everybody else left when it was going to become um, insolvent and i stayed because i wanted to save it and i believed in it and i didn't save it personally but i appointed people and i i didn't close it and that's that's that was my contribution <laughs> so it's survives and it's wonderful and I'm going to share some thinking from the leader of that black charity shortly. So that included me being chair during the Black Lives Matter events and the sad loss of George Floyd. So like my professional role is as a social worker in an area, a part of South London where it's nearly majority Bane and that means for um, those who don't use that term it's black and minority ethnic, a governmental type term problematic, not universally adored, but shorthand uh, for me as a social worker, we use that a lot. And there's something about the pandemic and um, the research coming forward that there's a disproportional impact on people's health if they're from a black, um, especially African background, African Caribbean black background, um, disproportional impact, which is not necessarily only about oppression, but maybe genetic, maybe health related and there's still research going on into that. So a word about terminology, language is a living thing and it's more important that we have the conversations than that we worry too much about the language that we use. There are many terms used, we don't for example use the American term very frequently, people of colour, it's a little bit more common now in England but it's not that widely used. Uh, we're more likely to say black or we're more likely to, in academic circles to say black and brown is the new bane because people don't like the term BME or bane. Don't worry about it, just keep trying to engage with the issues would be my advice. Um, I think you have BIPOC, which is used in America sometimes, black and indigenous and people of colour, so that's another one. But um, don't worry about getting it right because 
it being a living thing and a painful thing, you never will. Just have the conversation. So some of the ideas that we draw on in social work, I wanted to share with you. Bron from Brenner's social ecological model. Look at how old that is. <laughs> 1979, very old. Um, it's a look at nested systems. So the young people that we're working with, and we ourselves as people, are part of a nested system of micro of, of different contexts. So we have our own personal and internal world to which we take these nested systems. We have the micro system of our relationship or our family or our caregivers. Uh, and for some children, we know that's very disrupted and for others more stable or less. And then we have little systems around it. So the home life, the family, the school, and the immediate systems. Then we have broader organizational systems and then wider cultural systems. Uh, this is an invitation. This may be very familiar to you or it may not be. And so this is an invitation. Sometimes in the therapeutic world, we can focus too much or locate too much distress within a single person. And so it's an invitation to always remember that things are located in other places too that affect us and affect our clients. So meaning is contextual. I'm just going to move these faces. So Edo Lodge, a black woman writing about white privilege, she's inviting us to think about the fact that if we're white, and I know not everybody on this call is, but if we're white, we, we don't necessarily notice what we don't notice. So I don't necessarily notice that when I go out, my car isn't stopped every time because it's, it's a negative. But this is sometimes when you're trying to talk about these issues, it's very difficult for people because they need their eyes opened a little bit. And so this is a, an attempt to define what white privilege is. The man who's the CEO of the charity that I chair, it's called Dr. Errol Francis. He has not one, but two doctorates. <laughs> Amazing. One's honorary. And he, he earlier in the year, he had a campaign against the hypocrisy of the responses mm -hmm. to Black Lives Matter from the great cultural institutions in the UK. A lot of them put up the black square immediately, but they didn't think about their own practices, their own gathering of artifacts, the way they present those artifacts to the public and the staff they have working with them who they didn't necessarily protect from risk at this time. So we have a new charter that we've put out from the charity, which is in the resources at the end of the slides, which is challenging people to join the dots between wanting to express solidarity and their own personal practices and institutional practices. He invites us to reframe these donations and facts and to recognize what he quotes from Spivak a long time ago as epistemic violence, the way that colonization and oppression colonizes people's capacity to think and the way that they think and their responses to oppression. Burnham is a slightly later idea. Burnham wrote about the social graces, the graces being all of these G's and R's and A's and C's, a slightly different approach to thinking about oppression. So a person with different, well, a person can have lots of different things that affect their identity. And some of those will um, confer, because of society, more or less well-being and power in society. And the same person, it's completely contextual because the same person in one setting with the same graces will have an experience of being more oppressed or less oppressed in a different setting. And this is a, a way that can be quite handy for us as therapists to think about ourselves and to think about the people we work with and to think about the power relationships between that. I'm aware of the time going on. Let me move this over. Um, so my, my social graces, for example, which affect each other and are relating to the context. So I'm more or less disadvantaged depending on what's going on and why, what I need to get in that situation. I'm a white older cis woman. I'm a bi dyke, a Kinsey five. I put the reference at the end. No one, no one under 50 has ever heard of Kinsey usually. So I put that for your interest because it helps to avoid the polarity that we can have sometimes with the labels that we use to protect ourselves. I'm lower middle class, but I'm educated. I'm first generation British. I have parents from colonised territories. I have a hidden disability. In work with other people, if I can explicitly acknowledge the sources of power that I have, not so much the sources of disadvantage, 
because my experience of those may be very different even if they look shared but if I can put on the table and make it okay to talk about the fact that I may have power definitely have structural power legal power um, then the people that I'm working with may feel empowered to speak about those things they may have learned to survive and to not mention those things at all normally so this is an example of Black Panther uh, and just thinking about diversity and the tools and images that we work. I know you've done some work on your projective and sanitary materials, for example. We need to think about the tools, the imagery, the symbols that we use and seek out diverse heroes, heroines, references at all opportunities. Our poems, the things that we have available for collage work, the, the cards that we send are all valuable. For example, from my community arts practice, one of the songs that one of the groups that I know wanted to share with people was the um, the lady who was sampled in the Moby track years ago, Lord knows the trouble I've been. And her name is Vera Hall. So rather than simply share a song from a nameless person, the group that wanted to sing that song researched, who is that person that we don't know about? Who were they? Where do the songs come from? What's the meaning of the songs? How can we honour her in the, the work? And so that's one approach that you can take to thinking about power and oppression in work that doesn't naturally invite it and where it's not enculturated to do that. A quote that Edo Lodge quotes um, for, in relation to privilege, that just because we understand that we have privilege and we have different types of privilege depending on age and depending on skin color and also class often isn't mentioned um it just knowing it doesn't make a difference it's not reduced just because we understand it but to own it and to accept it can help us to strategize around it to be explicit about it with people rather than kind of being uncomfortable and trying to pretend that it's not happening and we may be able to choose recognizing our privilege we may be able to actively choose to step away from our advantages for example i'm stepping away from being chair now it's the right time i can move on and invite other people small changes can make a difference so here's an example of a greetings card that i've given to one of my young people another of my young people i went up to visit her she's a black girl she's in a place full of white people in a white community a few black staff mainly white staff she had 25 birthday cards, all of them, none of them recognized her race. I gave her one with a black girl, just a fun card. She was like, ooh, it made a difference just to make a small acknowledgement. The therapeutic task includes ourselves always. We can liberate the people who we're speaking to, we can give them tools to reflect on their position and their experience of life, but we also very much need to do that for ourselves. One final word really about resilience. Resilience is a big buzzword. When I was younger as a practitioner in mental health, the, the idea was all, everybody was talking about stress. Now we talk about resilience and how people can be made more resilient. And, it, resilient. and it's a brilliant idea. The only danger is that with our culture, everything can tend towards locating things within the individual. So Crutchley, that we should problematize resilience and just make sure that we're not asking people to be resilient to something unacceptable that we move away from it being individualized and kind of how can we bolster them up to think about what what's around them what can we do about resistance or change as well not only for our clients but for ourselves and the nested systems of oppression offer multiple opportunities for this it may be too difficult for you to challenge people face to face with your circumstances, with your so social graces, but you may feel that you can publicize a campaign, you can sign a petition, you can have conversations that are safer at greater distance. And so the Bronfen, if we return to Bronfenbrenner, it can help us to think about what might be helpful. Here's an example of how to legitimize and broaden out righteous anger Sometimes the anger our clients feel is absolutely a tool for their survival. So this is a group of LGBT um, black African people claiming their right to be religious, protesting against the fact that it's not allowed. And sometimes the external and the internal, I, I like to nudge therapists to straddle that a bit more. It's quite familiar to social workers, but we don't always do it well. 
So in our own practice and context, how you can take what I've shared with you is to bring, bring it into supervision, bring it into clinicians as a natural thing to talk about, to make time for. It can feel awkward, but have a go. And then there's a few more quotes and some references and a few of my heroes and heroines. There we go. Thank you very much. Sorry, I ran slightly over time. <laughs> Not too bad, though. That's me. All done. Thank you, Catherine. Um, you know, uh, 10 minutes um, is not enough for a topic like this. So I appreciate that you were willing to consolidate it given the constraints of um, all the things, all the ways that we want to represent everyone on this call. But this is among the most important conversations that we can all have. And um, I'm so grateful for you to be here and put this together for us. Um, I'm thrilled to have a call that I'm part of where this is what we're learning about. And um, I'm still learning about exactly what you are presenting. So my gratitude and appreciation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add a comment, please? I think so. Yes. Hello. Catherine, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Lovely to see you. Uh, <laughs> it's like you're down the road. Yeah. But something I was thinking, I love what you're saying about nested systems. And for those of us also who come from a Gestalt background, I was thinking of the connection between that and field ideas that <laughs> We're never just one individual that, you know, there are forces that support us sometimes and the constraints that hold us back. And it's very interesting to move away from just looking at the individual to look at what are the systems around. However, the thing that really I'm aware of is that in my training and many of the trainings here in social work, I think certainly more so in counseling and psychotherapy, they're very white and there is a need to decolonize the curriculum so that the things you were talking about earlier in terms of using poetry, bringing in the arts, many other ways of being able to help people relate to their own experience. This is something we're needing to do I think in many Maybe this is just an English thing, I don't know, maybe it's other countries too, but it's certainly something about how do we look at our own trainings? Are we just recruiting in our own light, which misses the problem? Because that way we re reduce the stereotyping and just having very few role models in the world of, of helping children. And we need those role models to be from everywhere in the world, not just white or middle class or whatever yeah. but thank you yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you thank thank you um and uh just from the response at, uh, in other countries not just the us or the uk oh. i'm seeing a lot of gratitude um from people and um connection to this topic as being relevant Hi. i think we all share it 